Hey guys, welcome back to Recreational Sniper. Tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to finish up doing some uh, parts of this setup. I've got the cheek riser kit, so I'm going to go up and see which cheek riser is going to fit me best. This one's a little short, as I've said before, so I'm going to go up uh, another quarter inch and then if that's not high enough I'll go up another half inch which is what this is it it comes standard with the 0.25 inch cheek riser from Magpul and this is a kit that includes the 0.5 and 0.75 cheek riser um, down here towards the muzzle I'm adding a Ultradyne and this is the Pegasus 762 tanker brake compensator add that to it because these little short lightweight rifles are going to buck a little with a, a heavy 308 load um, i've got uh, adding a sling to this and so i needed to buy this uh, type 1 sling qd insert for the back of the stock here and then i've got a m lock uh, qd uh, set up for the front of the stock here so QD obviously means quick disconnect and then I've got the Magpul MS1 QD quick, di quick disconnect sling that I'm going to be using with this setup um, I'm still waiting on some federal gold medal burger 180 five grain juggernaut bullets uh, and the cool thing about the juggernauts for this setup is that particular bullet was shown to remain stable through the transonic zone so even though they're super heavy and they're going to go subsonic around 1100 yards out of this rifle um, as long as you've got enough elevation adjustment you can push it on out there as as uh, as far as you know as far as you can so with this setup, once I get the 40 MOA base on here, which is again about 11 and a half mils, like 11.6 mils, give or take, um, I will have 31.6 mils of adjustment range to use, and that will effectively get me right out to a mile, maybe a little past a mile, with a 16 inch 308. But you know, that's going to take a lot of work. So. I've got uh, <clears throat> I've got a couple of empty ballistics tables here, and I've got one for the 175 Sierra Match King, and then once the 185 Burger Juggernauts come in, I'm gonna have another table for those as well. And basically, what I'm gonna do with this is when we go out to shoot, I'll take this blank. Uh, spreadsheet with me when we go out to shoot and uh, i check my temperature and if it happens to be 70 degrees in the morning or 80 degrees whenever we're shooting uh, i'll be able to record an accurate velocity for that temperature column and that will be the beginning of my load database or my ballistic table database will be beginning in whatever temperature range that range that is and of course this is an ongoing thing this is how these are set up and these are how these are how i make these um, obviously it's an unfired rifle so i got a brand new barrel um, so we don't know exactly how the muzzle velocity is going to change as this barrel gets more rounds on it initially it's probably going to uh, climb a little uh, within the first uh, 500 to 1,000 rounds on this barrel is probably going to be climbing in velocity a little bit. I would say it's probably going to climb up to 1,000 rounds, and then after that, it's going to start to deteriorate due to barrel and chamber wear and that sort of thing. But that's a whole other conversation for another video. Tonight, I really just wanted to finish setting this up. So first things first, we're going to look at... This, uh, I guess we're going to look at this break. Let's take a look at how we're going to set this break up right here. 
because this thing's pretty cool. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it out of the package so I can let you guys look at it up close. There is a collar and a lock nut in there, the self-timing nut. But up close, this is what this brake looks like. If I can get you to focus in there. So it just has 90 degree ports out the sides. And then it does have two ports in the top of the brake to kind of, it's a compensated muzzle brake. So it'll kind of keep that muzzle down uh, when it's being fired, when the rifle's being fired, keep it from jumping up by venting uh, some of the gases upwards. But they're also vented out at like a V pattern. So like that so the gases are going to kind of come up and away and they're not going to uh, obstruct your vision through the scope so that's the idea there i'm going to go ahead and take the thread protector off and go ahead and put our self-timing nut down there go ahead and add the collar on to this so it looks nice and pretty and thread this muzzle brake on here. Now, as you can see, we're all the way down, but our muzzle brake is not timed correctly at all. So we're gonna back it off until it looks like it's level and timed correctly. That looks pretty dang good. And then Now I'm going to have to go get me a wrench and tighten down our timing nut. Okay guys, so we got the muzzle brake tightened down and it should be tightened down to about 25 foot-pounds is what Ultradyne recommends. I don't really have a torque wrench so I kind of got to do it by feel. Uh, but as long as you're not like super over torquing it, you're not going to screw up the end of the muzzle, uh, you know. But it is possible if you really over torque a muzzle brake, you can stretch the muzzle a little bit and kind of mess the rifling up and that sort of thing, or maybe change the shape of the bore, uh, you know, microscopically, and that will affect your accuracy. But uh, as long as you're not going too crazy with it, most of the, most muzzle brakes and most of the time uh, they call for like like I said, about 25 foot pounds, and that's about all there is to it. So, one of the things that's cool about this scope setup, and this is going to come into play with setting up the uh, sling setup here, and uh, the scope does not have a side parallax adjustment, and for the most part, I'm pretty used to having a side parallax adjustment, but this scope does not have one. It's actually linear, and I'll show you guys that. This here is the parallax adjustment for this scope. This knob right here that I'm turning. All right, and so instead of having it on the side, there's no longer a turret over here. So what happens with this rifle is there's basically no obstructions on this side of, of, of the rifle itself. Whereas on this side, you have your windage turret, you've got your bolt knob, and that sort of thing. So it's obviously got some, some sort of width, some protrusion on the right side of the rifle. So my plan is, with the sling setup, is to have the sling set up on this side of the rifle and that way I don't have to deal with getting poked in the back with something like the parallax adjustment. So without the parallax adjustment on this side, it actually seems to make sense. It also makes the overall width of the rifle system narrower and which is really nice because that adds to its packability 
because some gun cases will not fit really wide scopes with these, uh, you know, the windage turret and the parallax turret and also a lot of the parallax setups on, on the side also have the knobs for turning on the illumination and whatnot. So thankfully the scope is not illuminated. I really prefer them to be not illuminated. You know, that's just going to add to, you know, something in, in, into the equation that has the potential for failure. So for the purpose of this rifle, we really want to avoid as much failure potential as possible. So with that being said, uh, we want to look at adding this sling to it, but before we get into adding the sling, <clears throat> I'm actually going to go ahead and do this cheek riser setup first. So I'll bring you guys back down here. We'll do the cheek riser setup first. All right, so uh, the other day, the other video I posted, I was talking about how this rifle stock had one screw that holds everything together on the back as far as your adjustments go. And what I was talking about is this little guy right here, and it's a, a flathead <clears throat> screw, and I really don't like that, especially for something that you may be manipulating more than one time. Uh, because the heads tend to, if you're not very careful with them, they can tend to uh, get a little screwed up and then it becomes harder and harder to use them. So we're going to go ahead and slide that back, pull this cheek riser piece off. And again, this is on the Magpul Hunter stock. If you look at Magpul, you can get this SGA cheek riser kit, but it also says in fine print um right here that it also is for the hunter sorry it's also for the hunter stock as well <clears throat> and <clears throat> we got a couple different pieces here one of them is a half inch rise and the other is a three quarter inch rise so Basically, I'm just going to mock these up real quick and see which one I like. And as you can see, the differences in the height on these. So, there you go. This is the factory one. So I'm going to go ahead and try the half inch one out first and see if I like that better. These actually fit tighter. I'm just gonna slide that up real quick. Oop, about to knock some stuff off the floor. I think that half inch may be the way to go. But I'm going to go ahead and put the three quarter on there just to see what that's like. Yeah, and the three quarter for me is just a little bit too much. So this half inch cheek riser is perfect. Yeah, I really, really like that. So, go ahead and put this, put this screw back in. The downside is, is you don't get to pick and just order one cheek riser. You end up with, you know, three or four of them before you figure out exactly which one fits you best. But... You don't have super fine tuning options with this. You get a, a zero, a quarter, a half, or a three quarter, and that's it. And it comes with the quarter inch one. So 
if you were to order the low riser kit it would actually come with another quarter inch one and a zero so that's one of the downsides to it but it's not a full-blown chassis system that's super super adjustable and all this it's got all these moving components and stuff and and for that reason it's actually probably more reliable and more durable it's not going to lose its setting for any reason because the hard piece made it up against that there and it's not going to move unless something happens and you drop this and or run over it or something then i could see that this polymer might break you know and you might have an issue there so now we got that set up let's move on to the sling setup let's work on this little guy here Okay, so we got those out of there. <clears throat> With this setup, basically we got our QD cup. And this little dude actually has to be kind of pressed in. And they give you an assortment of different lengths of screws, but they only give you one nut to use. So we got to figure out which screw is going to work for this purpose and which one's, you know, which one's going to be too long. And I think that one's probably too long. Not sure what the torque is supposed to be on that. And then we're gonna move on to setting up the M-lock part of this mount. I know for some of you guys, it's probably going way too slow, but for some other people, it might be helpful. Like any normal M-lock thing, it's gonna go kind of like a pain in the butt. And then we'll go into the side of the stock with them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push those through and I'm going to look closely and try to get these things lined up to where they are vertical in there to where they're not going to come out. Basically just going to carefully orient these. And then I'm going to use something to kind of put pressure on those while I tighten them up. So now that we got that set up, we'll go ahead and throw this sling on here and then we'll talk about some ammo setup too, which sling just pops in there, and pops in there and there you go. Yeah, the whole point is so I can throw it over my shoulder like this and then there's nothing poking me in the back because there's nothing on this side of the rifle there's no uh parallax adjustment to it like i said so it's flat on one side of the rifle that's really the main deal is there's nothing on this side of the rifle that's going to be poking me in the back if i've got it thrown over my shoulder and you know i'm gonna have to work on it a little bit adjust it up a little bit to get it really fit for me all right so we're here at the end of the video guys hopefully some of the stuff wasn't too drawn out wasn't too annoying for you guys but 
Uh, pretty much this is the way this rifle is going to be set up and I am going to do another video on like the complete reasoning behind having a 308 set up this way uh, with this particular scope with the muzzle brake this particular configuration with a short barrel detachable box magazine and a very simple but sturdy lightweight bipod setup right now I want to talk about ammunition choices for this rifle now a lot of people are probably thinking hey you know if you're going to run a really short barrel 308 you're probably going to want to run some lighter faster ammunition you know like uh, 150 grain or less like even down into like some 130s and 140 grain maybe some 110 grain like varmint type bullets but for me personally, this is going to be more of a, let's see how far we can push this thing type of deal. These are actually Sierra bullets. You can see there, Sierra Match Kings, 175 grain bullets. I've already kind of looked at, uh, looked at some ballistic models. I uh, already kind of entered in the ballistic coefficients and what I think would be the velocity coming out of a 16 inch barrel. They advertise at 2,600 uh, muzzle velocity. I'm gonna say that out of a 16 inch barrel, they're probably running about 2,450 to 2,500. We're probably losing about 100 feet per second there. And even with that, um, running those through a ballistic calculator program with the ballistic coefficients that are on here, um, we're looking at, we're looking at a supersonic range of, you know, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we're probably looking at a supersonic range about somewhere between 12 and 1300 yards. And at zero degrees, we're looking at a supersonic range around 900 yards. So typically around here, we're gonna see a lot of 80 degree days. We're gonna see some 70s and some 90s. You know, occasionally we'll get up into the hundreds. During the winter time, we might, get down into the 30s and 20s every once in a while overnight we'll get down into you know the single digits but not very often so i'm going to say at 70 degrees we're probably and this is just me making an educated guess i'm probably going to get about 2500 feet per second out of this rifle um, and with that being said at our normal barometric pressure in the area that i that I live in, I'll be able to get a uh, supersonic range close to about 1100 yards, give or take. And with this particular bullet, that's supersonic range. Now that's not a, me running out of adjustable uh, scope range, that's supersonic range. So with the, which I haven't gotten it yet, but it should be here soon, uh, maybe towards the end of the week, the 40 MOA base, which is 11 point, a little over 11.6 mils. Add that to half of the total adjustment range for the scope, which the total adjustment range for the scope is 40 mils. So half of that would be 20 plus 11.6. We get 31.6 mils of adjustment range that's usable. And that will get me to, with this bullet here, will get me to like 1,500 yards or something like that, 1,400, 1,500 yards. But we actually don't know how well these are gonna be stabilized beyond the supersonic range. And this is where the 185 grain uh, federal premium gold medal bullets come in but they're not using Sierra Match Kings, they're using Burger 185 grain Juggernauts. And uh, I watched a deal on that particular bullet, the Juggernaut from Burger. And the reason why they're calling it that is because it's uh, remains stable beyond the supersonic range. So they basically stated that you could shoot that bullet well beyond your supersonic range and it's not going to destabilize it's going to remain accurate and precise just as it was flying supersonic you know through the air um so basically 
they say that you're only limited by how much adjustment range you have in your your scope setup uh you know and you're you're only limited by how far you can see so with that bullet i was thinking probably out of this rifle uh we're not going to see 2500 feet per second because it is a little heavier we're probably going to see somewhere between 2400 and 2450 and I went ahead and looked at the ballistic, you know, some theoretical ballistic uh, drop for that. And based on 31.6 mils of adjustment range, I should be able to get this actually past a mile. It should get me almost to 1,700 meters. 1,600 meters is a mile. 1,700 meters is a little past that. And the reason why I'm talking in meters instead of yards with this particular setup is because this scope is in mils. Typically at 100 yards, if you're shooting, one mil is going to be 3.6 inches, where one minute of angle is going to be 1.047 inches. So this is being in 10th mil adjustments. Uh, every click on the scope is going to move the crosshair at 100 yards. It's going to move it 0.36 inches. And if you were to have a quarter minute of angle adjustment set up, you would move basically a hair, I mean, just a hair over one quarter inch or 0.25 inches uh, per turn, per click. So... The mill, the one-tenth mill setup is a coarser unit of measurement. One-tenth of a mill is more than one quarter of a minute of angle. So every click you make here versus your standard uh, quarter minute of angle adjustment scope, you're going to get a little bit more movement in your reticle. doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to be less accurate or less precise. I hope that kind of helps you guys understand a little bit um about this type of deal of course i really wanted to go with a, a minute of angle setup with this particular scope actually i wanted to go with the fixed 10 power like i said before in the other video but i ended up going with the fixed 12 power because they were completely sold out nobody had nobody has any of these scopes anymore the fixed powered ones they're just gone so i got a fixed 12 power and it's a uh, Mill scale reticle, mill, uh, mill scale turrets, and, you know, basically, you know, it worked out in a way that I'm going to get to work with you guys on learning how to uh, get used to using mills instead of using minutes of angle all the time. Uh, but basically, all you got to do is just kind of dumb it down and say, hey, they are both uh angular units of measurement and that's all you need to know they're just two different scales but they basically measure the exact same thing just in two different ways and the one advantage to it being in mills is everything is in like units of 10 and you know where that's a big disadvantage with using minutes of angle the only reason why i use minutes of angle is because i'm super used to it and it's easier for me this is going to be a, give me a, you know, I'm going to have a little bit of a learning curve figuring it out, but, you know, I'll be able to share that with you guys. So, with that being said, that's probably going to be it for now until we get to the range this weekend. Uh, it is Mother's Day Sunday, so hope you guys, you know, don't forget about your moms out there. But we are going to try to make it to the range Sunday because it's, you know, the only day I really have to do any testing. We're going to run these two boxes of ammo through this rifle, uh, get it kind of broke in a little bit because it's never been fired. And we're going to see how it does. We're going to chronograph everything and see where we're at with velocity. Um, we do know that probably over the next couple hundred rounds three four hundred rounds that the velocity is going to pick up over time so it may not be a great idea to really start building ballistic tables while we know that the velocity is going to be gaining um, but you know once we hit that equilibrium point uh, where the velocity is no longer picking up and then it kind of very slowly starts drifting off um, then we'll really get to dial in some really good ballistic charts. And I hope you guys stick around for that. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs>
So you guys have a great evening and we will see you next time in the next video. Thanks for watching.